Welcome viewers to part two of the 25th annual autumn estate planning seminar brought to you by Chipman Mizuko Emerson, a Danbury and Southbury, Connecticut law firm. My name is Richard Land, and I'll be the presenter for part two, which is devoted to how the SECURE Act affects planning for certain retirement accounts. I'm picking up where Jim Flaherty's presentation in part one left off. So here is part two. But my topic is retirement plan accounts. So the, the, way, the way these accounts are taxed and limitations put on contributions and um, required minimum distributions, and that's one of those things that changes all the time and you have to stay on top of it. And the most recent change is a thing called the SECURE Act. Um, but just a few years ago, there was the, oh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that had an impact too. Um, and before I can really talk about how those new laws uh, affect your planning, I think I need to set the stage by telling you what those uh, pre-law change rules were. So I'm going to go through that quickly. Um, and when you boil it all down, it's pretty simple. When you set up a retirement plan account, uh, the types we're talking about, traditional accounts, they're set up with pre-tax dollars. That means they, they've never been subjected to income tax before. And you get a deduction from income when you, when you set them aside in a special retirement account. And all, and all the uh, income and gains in that account are deferred from tax. So they aren't taxed right away as the, as the accounts grow. Um, and so you're doing that over say the full term of your employment. So if you're uh, in retirement mode, maybe you're 65, maybe you're 75. Oh, it depends on uh, how long you want to work, but um, it, they build up that way, contributions, tax deductible, gains and income inside those accounts, tax deferred, and they can get up to some pretty large sums. And then you reach an age and the government tells you, we're not gonna let you do that anymore. Um, it was always intended to be for retirement. So we're going to say that you must, re you must withdraw certain minimum amounts. And when those amounts are withdrawn, that's when it's subjected to income tax. Now, under the old law, it used to be 70 and a half. You'd have to start withdrawing your required minimum distributions at 70 and a half. Uh, not long ago, that was changed to 72. So there's a change. Um, you got a little bit longer to build up those tax deferred um, accounts. But age 72, they're required to come out. And there are there are tables that tell you what those amounts are. They're minimum required distributions and they're basically based on your life expectancy. Um, and so they can stretch out until you, until you die. Um, of course, you can take out more if you want to. Um, and I'll get into that in a second about why you might want to now, because it has a lot to do with how the tax laws are changing. Um, so, you, uh, it goes on that way, and then you pass away, and you got to figure out how you want those funds to be distributed to your beneficiaries. And there are special rules for that, that relate to required minimum distributions. Under the old rules, um, the uh, default rule, the general rule is it all has to come out in five years. Okay, but there's a lot of exceptions that swallow up that rule. And people use those exceptions in their planning. So and they, they try real hard to avoid the five-year rule. Because if you think about it, your account has been building up all those years. And now it's, you know, one and a half, two million dollars. And for all that to come out in five years, that's a, a lot of income tax paid over a short period of time. So people, people want to avoid that. Um, and so the way to do that is to take advantage of, of the rules that get you out of the five-year rule. And uh, in, under the old law, and it's true under the new law too, if you're a, a, a beneficiary that's considered a designated beneficiary, and that's a, that's a special definition in the tax law, what is uh, a designated beneficiary is, 
But if you're an individual and you're a designated beneficiary, you get to take that out over your life expectancy under the old rule. Um, so that means every year you look at the tax table and you, um, they tell you how much you're supposed to take out. So basically the tax table start with your life expectancy. And if your life expectancy is let's say 23 years in that year after the year of your death, you're gonna take out 123rd. And then the year after that, it's 122nd. The year after that, it's 121, 121st. Um, so that's the way the old rule works. Now under the SECURE Act, I mean, the government's looking for revenue. They're getting tired of waiting so long to, uh, to collect the tax dollars that they've put a limit on how long uh, you can keep those funds in your retirement account. You have to take it out in 10 years. But it's a little bit different than the old required minimum distribution rule because um, you don't have to take out a little bit every year. You can take it out all the first year. You can take it out all in the 10th year. You can take it out in whatever combination of amounts uh, you want to during that 10 year period, but it, it all has to come out in 10 years, unless you're um, a beneficiary known as an eligible designated beneficiary. I'll get into that in a second. But, um, but it's important that, that you understand that there's this 10 year period where you've got complete flexibility about how much you want to take out and how much you want to leave in and even take out nothing and withdraw, take out nothing for nine years and withdraw it all in the 10th year. Now that's very important in this time of, of tax bracket changes because under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, brackets are lower than they used to be and likely lower than they'll be in 2026 when Tax Cuts and Jobs Act rules go away. That's when um, the, the snapback of the old rules happen. And that's assuming that the, the, the current set of rules uh, is allowed to continue until 2026. It's possible, depending on the results of the election, that, um, well, certainly um, Joe Biden has said that he'd repeal all the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, benefits. So you might very well be facing before that 10 years is up higher, higher brackets. So your beneficiaries, if you were to die this year, might be thinking about, you know, I think I'd like to, to withdraw funds now while the brackets are lower. And um, I don't want to take my chances 10 years from now when the tax brackets are higher. Or, um, or even now, let's just, before you pass away, you're still living and you're trying, and, but you're beyond 59 and a half and you can with, make withdrawals. You can make withdrawals um, without any penalty. And you're thinking about, well, this is interesting. I've got lower brackets that apply now and maybe higher brackets later. I'm not making much income now. I just retired. Maybe it's time for me to withdraw more. Or another thing to consider is maybe it's time to withdraw and convert to, an, uh, to a Roth IRA. Now, I'm not going to get into Roth IRA as much, except to say that um, if you have one, they're wonderful because the growth and in the income in those Roth IRAs are tax exempt, not tax deductible, not tax deferred, exempt. Um, so you might want to take the opportunity to withdraw some funds from your IRA now while the rates are lower, if your income tax situation permits it you know, and you're, you actually are in the lower brackets and convert to, to Roth. And then they stay tax exempt even after you die. Of course, your, uh, your beneficiaries will have to take out the Roth IRA within 10 years. But um, during that, that time, it's building up tax exempt, which can be um, pretty dramatic, uh, pretty dramatic advantage. So, all right, so that's, anybody want to uh, clarify anything I've said or, or tell me where I might be wrong or, um, you know, contribute to understanding here? Okay, so um, we have this situation, we have a 10 year rule. 
but there are exceptions to that. And um, there's always exceptions built on top of exceptions, built on top of exceptions in the tax law. This is one of those examples. We have a, a exceptions to the 10 year rule that certainly apply to surviving spouses. And so the rule that applies to surviving spouse is pretty much the same as it's, it's been. A uh, surviving spouse can make the account of the uh, deceased participant her own, uh, or she can roll that account over to her own IRA. And that rollover is not going to be subjected to tax. In effect, it's like she, she pulled it out, surviving spouse pulled it out 100% put it in her own IRA, and there's no tax on that withdrawal. But it's really not a withdrawal. It's, it's usually a rollover. It either goes into another account with the same IRA administrator in the wife's name, or surviving spouse's name, sorry. And, um, or it continues on in, in the same old account as the uh, deceased participant had, but will be considered surviving spouses. But it's rolled over. It becomes the surviving spouse's account. And then um, when, when surviving spouse is age 72, age 72, assuming that age hasn't been reached already, that's when surviving spouse must, must take out required minimum distribution. So that's an opportunity too for surviving spouse. Don't forget, one spouse has passed away, maybe the real breadwinner spouse, and now surviving spouse has a new IRA, the rollover IRA, and that might be an opportunity for the surviving spouse while income tax brackets are low during this 10 year, at least until 2026, to think about a Roth IRA, or at least pulling, pulling more out at lower brackets. But uh, the Roth IRA, pull it out and um, convert it to a, to a Roth where it's gonna be tax exempt. Um, so that's one, so surviving spouses have rollovers, but they do have new options available, new things to think about because of these changes in brackets that they're gonna have. Uh, then surviving spouse passes away, designated beneficiary takes the, um, is, is the beneficiary and must take it out within 10 years. Now, unless, the designated beneficiary is an eligible designated beneficiary. I already said the spouse is one of those, but another one is a child, a minor child. There's a uh, designated beneficiary is a minor child. That minor child uh, can take distributions out over uh, the life expectancy as the life expectancy table suggests or dictates. And then when reaches age of majority, uh, the 10 year rule applies. Um, interesting thing about that is nobody really knows what age of majority is in that context. Um, the tax law kind of makes it depend on what the state says age of majority is. I think that probably means 18 in Connecticut, um, but states set different ages for different things. Um, one thing for sure that if you're, um, if you have not completed your course of study and you're under age 26, you'll be considered a minor child. I guess there's some question about what a course of study is, um, but that's the rule. And then, so these, these new laws, we're all waiting for regulations to explain to us what they really mean. Um, and then there's the, the other type of of uh, eligible designated beneficiary is a disabled or chronically ill. Disabled or chronically ill beneficiary is the type of beneficiary that can take it out over that beneficiary's life expectancy, not stuck with the 10 year rule. Um, now the thing about, those are great. I mean, if you're an eligible uh, designated beneficiary, um, it's nice to be able to spread it out over a longer period of time, but it's not such a great thing if this, this beneficiary who's really suffering from some sort of disability, either a child is too young to receive it, or maybe an incapacitated person is just unable to deal with it. It's probably not that great 
to give those sums to the person who has what amounts to a disability. But the way the tax law is written right now, to have those sums payable to a trust for management for that eligible beneficiary, designated beneficiary, there's too much uncertainty about that. We don't really know how it works. We won't know until regulations come out. So but can I just mention or interject, Rich? Yes. So perhaps the disabled beneficiary can get their distribution and put it into a self-settled special needs trust, which might help at least protect some benefits that disabled beneficiary is going to get right. or is receiving. Yeah. And that's why we have Allison. I'll go into some of my introduction to Allison now because the thing that she's most passionate about is uh, the elder law areas, those areas that relate to planning for the chronically ill and disabled. And that is one of the reasons why we are very fortunate to have Allison with us because she knows better than anybody else I know what those rules are and how to jump through all the hoops to, to qualify for those rules. Uh, but before I, before I say anything nice about Allison, um, I, would like, I, I would like to give you, my, my colleagues, uh, the opportunity to ask me some questions that will clarify, because I have a feeling I, I uh, tried to go over some of those things a bit too fast and probably stumbled over my tongue a few times. So please help me out. Rich, I, I probably interjected too early, but isn't it also the case that an estate is not a designated beneficiary? Thank you. I was going to mention that. This five year, I talked about how to, how horrible it was to be stuck with the five year rule and how we use these exceptions to get away from it. But I had meant to go into, okay, what, what do you wanna make sure you avoid to avoid the five year rule? Okay, one thing is you don't wanna make your estate the beneficiary and you don't want, you really don't want, you wanna to try to protect those accounts from having a legal obligation to pay expenses and debts of, the, of an estate. So we go to great lengths to make sure that um, those, those accounts will not go to the estate. But sometimes clients do it by mistake and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, another way to fall into the trap of, of the five-year rule is if you have a charity that's a beneficiary of an account. And if you don't do the post-mortem steps, post-mortem, I mean, fancy word for after death planning to avoid that result, you could be stuck with the five year rule. Another thing is if you have uh, an account, a beneficiary of an account that is actually a trust and, the, and you can't really tell who the oldest beneficiary of that trust is, then you'll be stuck with the five year rule as well. So those are the three main ways you you get stuck with the five-year rule and you failed to qualify for any of the exceptions. And I'm always hesitant to use a trust as a beneficiary of a qualified plan, but there are those times when you have to do it. And it's, we have to always make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure that we're clear as to who the identity of the beneficiaries uh, and how we define income, which is different from an IRA distribution standpoint and a trust accounting standpoint, one might say. Uh, so uh, not that it can't be done, it certainly can. I do try to impress on clients that these are tricky little trusts to draft and you gotta be really careful or else you're gonna break a rule. So, and then what Jim said, especially about if you're naming a trust that's for the benefit of a surviving spouse and you want it to qualify for the marital deduction, maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds now, but it's very important that you pay attention to the income distribution rules that apply to marital deduction. So, um, and I always apologize to my clients about, I apologize it's so complicated, it's not my fault. I. Uh, 
I just want them. I just, it's hard to make it simple when they make it so complicated. Anybody else? And it's also important to, even if you're naming your spouse as your primary beneficiary, it's, it's always a good idea, I think at least, to name a, a contingent beneficiary just in case your spouse predeceased you, at least to try to avoid the account falling into your estate. I'm not sure if that's common practice for the rest of you, but I, I always like to have contingent beneficiaries if, if at all possible. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you too. I'm glad you're around because I, I, that would have been, I should have mentioned that, yeah. Definitely, contingent beneficiaries, designated beneficiaries, yes. And tangentially related to that, you know, one of the things, and it's not necessarily just qualified plans, but beneficiary designations in general, I'm running into a lot of uh, places where the financial advisor has said to them, you know, name beneficiaries and always name beneficiaries and not the estate, but actual individuals. And that's great on the retirement plans, may not be so great from an estate planning standpoint. So for example, if we've got a taxable estate, let's say, uh, but a married couple where ordinarily it would go all to the surviving spouse, but we'd want to fund that disclaimer trust we talked about earlier. If the spouse is the primary beneficiary and the kid, kids are contingent beneficiaries uh, and the spouse has to disclaim at the first death, well, we've just blown the opportunity to keep that in further trust for her, his or her benefit. Uh, so, one of the things when we're doing estate planning is we look very closely at what the beneficiary designations are and make sure, you know, I had one just like this where the advisor with all good intentions had, had said, don't worry, we'll set up beneficiary designations and they're gonna parallel your will exactly. Uh, we had enough that we still had to go to probate, notify a number of charitable beneficiaries uh, that they weren't getting both. They were charitable, they were beneficiaries on your one account. Uh, there was nothing that was passing to them as a result of the will. And fortunately it was a small amount so we didn't have the attorney general who's always noticed on these things uh, stepping in. Uh, but we had to explain to them that it was a beneficiary designation by which <clears throat> that was the mechanism by which you were gonna get your charitable contribution from the deceit. But it was it was sticky and was expensive for the client to have to sort through all of that. If, before I turn it over to Allison, do you mind if I I uh, I plug something? I you know all the things that we've been talking about um, are covered in the video I have posted on YouTube. Basic estate planning updated just this year, and it's 15 parts that covers all sorts of things that. We're talking about now and are likely to talk about some more. So um, if anybody actually watches this and uh, wants more information, you can get it at that video on YouTube. Um, Basic estate planning in Connecticut by yours truly, Richard Land. And uh, so now it's time to introduce Allison, which I really already did um, when I talked about how lucky we are to have her. Um, and so Allison, tell us all about the five most frequently asked elder law questions. Thank you, Rich. Before I get to that, what's the best way for people to find your videos? Um, <laughs> well, you could go to YouTube and search for my name. Okay basic estate planning, or the channel is RSLand100. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 